flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Will do. Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderwoman Turner. Here. Alderman Filginzi. Alderman Proctor. Here. Alderwoman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderwoman Connolly. Alderman Donnellan. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. Well, I have the privilege of uh, giving the first proclamation under the coronavirus era, and uh, it's to uh, Christ the King. And uh, as we know that the virus has uh, disrupted many of our lives, and this is no different, but it's important that we really uh, celebrate those that, uh, you know, the good accomplishments that they've had, especially for our students. And I appreciate Alderman Hanauer bringing this forward with regards to the proclamation. If you'd like to come up. And whereas the Christ the King 8th grade boys basketball team truly represented their school motto, Champions in Christ, as they showcased teamwork, spirit, and pride in the classroom and on the court, and whereas teammates including Jacob Carsons, Tom Davis, Drew DeJanes, Tomas Dinda, Max Gebhardt, Noah Gray, Levi Hanauer, Paul Hartman, Carter Hemmer, Andrew Hendricks, Tony Conga, Chris Link, Magnus McDonald, Bryce Musgrave, and Matt Sainer learned about hard work, dedication, and sportsmanship as they ended their 2019-2020 season with 28 wins and two losses. And whereas the Cougars paved their way to victory at the Illinois Elementary School Association Boys 1A Tournament, defeating Peoria St. Vincent de Paul in the quarterfinal, Lovejoy in the semifinal, and went on to defeat Oglesby Holy Family in the final to become the 2020 Illinois Elementary School Association Boys 1A 8th grade champion, state champions. And whereas an incredible milestone would not be possible without the countless hours of coaching and mentoring provided by their coaching staff of Paul Hartman Jr., Todd DeJanes, Pat De Hemmer, and Danuta Dinda. And whereas it is also a moment of thank you to the Christ the King administration and teachers, including Father Joseph Ring, Principal Pam Fahey, and Athletic Director Bob Hamilton for their leadership and guidance of these students, along with their encouragement, love, and support from these players, families, and friends, and fellow parishioners. And whereas we recognize that our community strength lies within our next generation, and the efforts demonstrated by these young men from the Christ the King show that Springfield's future is very bright. Now, therefore, I, James O. Langfelder, Mayor of the City of Springfield, on behalf of Alderman Ralph Hanauer and the City Council members and residents, do hereby proclaim that Tuesday, July 21st, 2020, shall be Christ the King 8th grade boys basketball day in the City of Springfield and call upon all citizens to formally recognize the 2019-2020 Christ the King boys basketball team and their coaches for their achievements. Congratulations. Thank you, Mayor Langfelder, Alderman Hanauer, and the rest of the council. We, we greatly appreciate this. This was a culmination of a lot of hard work, sweat, blood, and tears from these young men over the years. And 
Fortunately, February 20th was not impacted by the COVID virus, but they really lost every opportunity to celebrate their accomplishment. And being able to be here today, uh, the recognition that you have levied to them is, is greatly appreciated. And I believe a moment they'll never forget. Thank you very much. Musgrave, Max Gephardt, Carter Henry, Andrew Hendricks, Paul Hartman, Tomas Dinda, Tony Camgang, Matt Sonner, Jacob Carstens. Levi Hanauer. Noah Gray. Coach Hartman. Coach DeJanes. Coach Hammer. The uh, first item on the agenda is docket number 2020-025 for the property located at 500 East Cook Street. Petitioner, Springfield Clinic, LLP. Present zoning classification is B2, General Business Service District, section 155.034. Requested zoning relief reclassification to S3, Central Shopping District, section 155.032, and a conditional permitted use pursuant to section 155.175. Establishment of classification of conditional permitted uses and section 155.051. Certain drive-in businesses to allow use for a medical office or clinic with a drive-through laboratory drop-off window. Petitioner further requests that if recommendation of denial of the proposed reclassification to these S3 classification, petitioner would accept in the alternative reclassification of the subject real estate to the B1 Highway Business Service District classification along the with variances to eliminate the front and rear yard requirements of section 155.061. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning staff recommendation is denial of the requested S3 zoning and in the alternative staff finds the requested alternative relief reclassification to B1 and variances to eliminate the front and rear yard requirements of section 155.061 and the requested conditional permitted use is appropriate. Planning zoning commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning staff with the exception of the CPU as the request for the CPU was withdrawn by the petitioner. Chair will entertain a motion. Um, motion to approve the uh, staff, staff recommendation. Second. Been moved and seconded to, to approve the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation. Second, any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Roll call. Oh, roll call. Guess we're not to that level yet. Not there yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Aye. Alderwoman Turner. Aye. Alderman Fulgenzi. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman DeCenso. Yes. Alderman McMiniman. Aye. Alderwoman Connolly. Alderman Donnellan. Aye. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. We have eight ayes and no nays, Mayor. Hey, guys. 
So the motion passes. Next item on the agenda is document number 2020-026 for the property located at parcel 1. Dash 1001 Lincolnshire Boulevard, parcel 2, dash proposed vacation, vacation of Octavius via 6th Street frontage adjacent to the northern property line of parcel 1. Petitioner is Fred Wallace, LLC. Present zoning classification is B1 General Business Service District, section 155.033. Requested zoning relief, a variance of section 155.001. <coughs> Definitions lot two, allow two principles, uses of lot, a car wash and the existing billboard. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. Chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move that we accept the Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff's recommendation. Second the motion. We move and second to accept the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation and second it. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. And the clerk will call the roll. Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Aye. Alderwoman Turner. Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. Alderman Aye. Pro Thank you. Alderman Proctor. Yes. He's back. Alderwoman DeCenso. Yes. Alderman McMiniman. Aye. Alderwoman Connolly. Alderman Donnellan. Aye. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. Nine ayes and no nays, Mayor. Thank you. Motion passes. Next item on the agenda and final item is docket number 2020-027 for the property located at 104 East North Grand Avenue. Petitioner is First Step Women's Center. Present zoning classification is B1 Highway Business Service District, Section 155.033. Requested zoning relief, reclassification to R5B. General Residence and Office District Section 155.021 and a variance of Section 155.055. Minimum lot width for residences to allow the use of the property as a transitional living situation for up to 24 months for women who have recently aged out of their foster care system. Residents are required to either one, attend school full time, two, work full-time, or three, attend school part-time and work part-time. The intention is to provide residential care for up to four women with one live-in house manager for a total of five persons living on the premises at one time. Part of the premises on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. will be used for in-person application processing. The program is not equipped to accommodate residents who have substance abuse issues, nor are they equipped to accommodate residents who are on felony probation. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is denial. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is a use variance for the property for the use as described in the petition. The chair will entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. Second. Been moved and seconded to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation of the variance for the property as described in the petition. And seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion will vote yes. Those opposed vote no. And the clerk will call the roll. Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Aye. Alderwoman Turner. <coughs> yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. Aye. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman DeCenso. Yes. Alderman Miniman. Aye. Alderwoman Connolly. Alderman Donlin. Aye. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. Nine ayes and no nays, Mayor. The uh, ordinance passes as uh, recommended. The chair will recognize Treasurer Busher for the presentation of the uh, financial report. Sorry, Mayor. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Mayor Langfelder. The corporate fund in the month of June had a beginning balance of $13,509,074. We took in total receipts of $17,021,694. The corporate fund had total disbursements in the month of June of $17,459,123, which left the corporate fund with an ending balance of $13,071,645 in the month of June. This concludes my report, Mayor Langfelder. Thank you. Thank you. Chair will entertain a motion to approve the financial report. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. All right. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Uh, we do have a presentation by Director McCarty on the uh, 
finances? Yep. Turn this thing around? Yes, please. I don't know, maybe you should ask Gene Mitchell. <laughs> I do like his face mask, Gene Mitchell's face mask. And uh, Director McCarty has his Notre Dame one, for those uh, not seeing it. Thanks. And for the record, Gene Mitchell has a Cub, Cub one. Come on, hand it out. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a while since I got to see your, well, smiling faces, at least some of you. Uh, I am here to give the long-awaited presentation on the impact of the pandemic on our city budget, particularly as it relates to the corporate fund. Uh, one of the reasons that it's taken this long, as some of you probably know, as we've talked about, is that we wanted to wait for the sales tax for April. There's a natural four-month delay before we get that sales tax. The activity in April, we actually didn't get the remittance or the information until July. And it was really important for us to get that because we feel that April is the floor of what we're dealing with, the worst case scenario, and that things just improve from there. And we've been seeing that in the numbers, and we've been seeing that anecdotally as you go out around town, you see more and more activity. So that kind of was what we were waiting on to get our worst, thank you, worst case scenario. So I'm going to start this presentation with the two pieces of good news that I have tonight. One is that we started doing our stress tests back in March when this all started. And of course, this being unprecedented and never happening before, or at least 100 years ago, I guess, which we don't have information for, we took a stab at what we thought might be the outcome, what the projections might be. And based on the data we have today, it's not as bad as we thought it would be back then. Uh, it's not good, as you'll see in a minute, but it's not as bad as what we thought it would be back then. The other thing is that's really helped us a lot is we were fortunate enough, I mean, I should say fortunate, we all worked hard to do it. We've been working hard for years to do it. We ended last year's fiscal year, fiscal year 20 at the end of February with the highest fund balance that we've ever had. And having that going into the pandemic in the new budget year has served us very, very well because what it's done is it's allowed us to weather the storm long enough to wrap our hands around the enormity of what we're dealing with. We didn't have any data. We didn't have any information to begin with. And so having that fund balance has allowed us to operate. You've heard the treasurer's reports in terms of the cash balance and the corporate fund. We've been able to try and maintain that because we had that fund balance to start out with. And that's really helped a lot. Now that we're at the situation we're in, we can get to the point where the numbers are in and we can start making some, some decisions from an administrative standpoint of what we're going to do to deal with the deficit that we're facing. So with that, those are the two pieces of good news. Now we'll get into the rest of it, which isn't quite so good. So everybody should know at this point in time that what we're dealing with, this, this quote-unquote disaster we're dealing with, is not like a hurricane or a tornado or, or an earthquake or anything like that. The negativity that comes from it from an economic standpoint is not on the expense side of the expense side of the ledger. Yes, there are expenses. There's no doubt about it. Face masks and sanitization and the, the walls that are up, the plexiglass, all that. There's a cost to that. There's no doubt to that. But we've been keeping track of costs. We implemented a program code immediately when this all went down so that we could track our costs. And looking at everything right now, we're somewhere in the $100,000, $200,000 range, depending on what we can submit and what we can't. We're still working through that. We're still getting guidance from the state on that. $100,000 to $200,000. I don't know if you saw it or not, but when the state introduced the CURES Act, C-U-R-E-S, uh, at the end of June, Springfield's allocation is $4.8 million that is made available to us to reimburse us for COVID-related expenses. The problem is this is not an expense issue for us. I mean, it is, but it's a revenue issue. That's what we're going to focus on in this presentation. You talk about how we fell into a recession, and it's the first stop point on there. On June 8th, officially the first recession since back at the Great Recession. We had one of the longest runs, if not the longest run. Dallas, I don't know. Since 2009. Since 2009, yeah, that's one of the longest runs. We've officially fell in a recession. Now, the problem that we have, or one of the many problems that we have in terms of the rebound is economists are all over the board. 
Is it a V? Is it a U? Is it a W? In other words, a double dip, which is a possibility with what's going on right now because you see cases are, are spiking in a lot of places. And I guess even in Sangamon County, the rolling average is probably the highest I heard on the radio, maybe the highest it's ever been. So you do run the risk of that W where you start to come back and then you go back down again. Or is it the, the as uh, Jim Circle called it, the swish, it's actually the Nike swoosh, um, is it going to be a long extended recovery over a number of years? Economists are all over the board on that. We really, we really just don't know. I mean, I think a lot of that's going to be determined on how quickly we get a vaccine. But we don't know that. So that's one of the many uncertainties that we're working with. The biggest issue for us is sales taxes. We're going to talk a little bit about sales taxes, dive into that tonight for a couple of slides. But that's really, really the issue. It's 45% of the corporate fund. And when you have something that's 45% of the corporate fund, that's the reason we waited this long, is we had to get those April numbers to see what we were dealing with. Unemployment is up 14.6%, I think, statewide, around 13% in this area. I don't have to tell you all about conventions and tourism. Poor Scott Dahl, I don't know if he's around here or not, but every night I'm sure he's, he's um, very unhappy with what's going on, and he should be. Uh, we talked to Scott quite a bit. In fact, some of the information you're going to see is through a collaboration with Scott and his resources to come up with the numbers and the projections. The bottom line is a lot of this is based on the consumer and consumer behavior, and that is all over the board. Some people are staying in, uh, continuing to stay in. Some people feel more freely to go out, whether or not there's a, we roll back to phase three. There's just a ton of uncertainty. So what we're presenting tonight is based on the latest data that we have. The things you're seeing tonight could very well be different a week, a month from now. As we get more and more information, we are constantly updating. So don't take what you see tonight as set in stone. It's really fluid but it is what we are best guessed based on what we have in our hands at this point in time. The next four slides I am not going to go over in detail unless you really want me to, Alderman Hanauer. I doubt that you do. Uh, this, is the, this is the raw data. This is the detail. I'll just explain how to read it so you can do it at your own leisure later. If it's shaded yellow, that is actual numbers. That reflects actual numbers versus budget this year. The white would be our projections. And what we've done from day one is run four different stress test scenarios. Scenario A would be our best case scenario. Scenario D would be our floor. And that really comes from looking at that April data and running that all the way out. As you can see there, for example, the state sales tax had 21% down versus budget in April. That's under the July column because of the delay. You see we run that all the way out. So that's our worst case scenario, we feel, because we feel that nothing is going to be as bad as April, hopefully based on what we know today. Uh, certainly that could change. Same thing for the city sales tax. Income tax, personal property tax, PPRT, those are numbers we actually got from the IML, so we plugged those in. And then we used our own experience again in um, vehicle tax and consulted with Director Dahl on the hotel tax, and that's how we came up. So the first two slides are your percentages for those funds. The next two, are the dollars associated with that. So I, went, I sent you all that email last week that said we were $2 million down in sales tax for the first two months. The way you get to that is you look at your first slide here with the dollars, and you can see they're all the same, right? So in June, June and July, which is March and April, we were down somewhere around eight to $900,000 on state sales tax, and then over a little over a million dollars, one to 1.1 on the city sales tax. When you combine all those together, that's the $2 million that I reported to you. So that's how you read these charts. And certainly we're available to answer any questions that you have. And before I get any further, I do want to take a moment to thank these two gentlemen, Dallas Whitford and Jeff Blazes, who are my revenue guys. They have been on this from day one, and they have spent tons and tons of time working on this and refining these numbers on a daily basis. So I do want to thank them. Next is a look at sales tax. Let's dive down to this. So I was on a webinar, uh, one of many webinars that my staff and I watch all the time, and uh, Dr. Ken Kriz from UIS was on there as a presenter. One of the things that he showed was that he had access to credit card data, like almost in real time credit card data, through an agreement that he has with some company. And seeing that, I reached out to Dr. Kriz and I asked him if he could share some of that information with me so that I could 
data mine at number one and number two present it here in the council and he was gracious enough to do so. So I do want to thank Dr. Kriz and the University of Illinois Springfield for providing this data to us. So this first one is just a look at aggregate credit card purchases. This is year over year change. So looking at this year versus last year, the same week, percentage change. So you can see, for instance, at the beginning, and uh, in, in, in the red is aggregate, which means in-store and online, everything. Whereas the blue is just in-store, brick and mortar, as you would, would think of it. So if you look at, say, the very beginning, at January 1, that week, looks like in aggregate, things were up 5%, but in-store was pretty much flat at 0%. That's how you read that. And what's interesting here, and, and quite frankly, a little scary, is just the disparity between the, the two lines. So obviously spending dropped all around across everything, but it dropped a heck of a lot more here in town. But that makes sense, right? You look at April, everything was shut down. The stores were shut down and everything else. And we don't yet get sales tax on online sales. That doesn't kick in until January 1st of 2021. So unfortunately, we're a year too early for that. Otherwise, it wouldn't be nearly as bad a situation as it is. All the pandemic has done is to take an issue that we've talked about for years, which is the prominence, the, the, the uh, escalation of online sales, and it's pushed people to do it even more. And once you push people to do it anymore, just about everyone that we listen to, that we talk to, that we hear from, uh, whether it's national radio or whatever, says once you push them into online, it's harder to, take, to get them back out. So. January 1, 2021 can't come soon enough for the city of Springfield to start taking advantage of those sales taxes for online. Right now, it's simply still the use tax, which we get pennies on the dollar for, unfortunately. The next slide is kind of interesting, is real interesting. Shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. So one of the things that Dr. Chris was able to give us was categories. So I asked him for everything in aggregate, which we already had. That's the red line. You can see that. That's the same as the blue line on the previous page, just a different scale. And then I, I pulled out travel, restaurants, and apparel. It's no secret that those categories have been hit very, very hard. And you can see that very well illustrated here in this graph. It's pretty clear that, uh, you know, you look at apparel, I mean, it dropped in next to zero because all the stores were closed in April, right, here. And this is just the, in, the Springfield only, the in-store purchases, by the way, if I didn't say that. Travel, restaurants dropped about 50%. Uh, looks like they're coming back a little bit, but they're still down for the year versus where they were year over year, which is not a surprise to anybody. It's disconcerting, not just because of the sales tax aspect of it, it's also, you have to think about the employment or unemployment aspect of it and what that means for our economy. Certainly that is also a concern for us. And you saw some of those numbers represented on that second page with unemployment and how the rates are way up. So let's get to the main slide, shall we? So stress test, this is where we are. Now I wanna stress one thing here. This is reflective of revenue shortfall only. This does not reflect, the use of fund balance does not reflect any cuts that we might do, because none have been implemented as of yet. We have run multiple exercises, but none have been implemented as of yet, we're discussing. And uh, it also does not count any potential relief we might get through the Cures or the CARES Act. Um, again, it could be a couple hundred thousand, or it could be more if there's success in getting that opened up to more items. Particularly if we could replace lost revenue, that would be fantastic. I just don't know if we're gonna get there or not. There seems to be a reticence from the state and the federal government to allow that type of reimbursement, so not really sure. So scenario A, this is our best case scenario. We're looking at a $10.3 million revenue shortfall versus budget. 12.2 for scenario B, and I should point out, scenario A does assume a vaccine. It assumes a vaccine in the month of October. So starting with, you'll see the numbers if you go back to that data we gave you. It does assume a vaccine. You start looking, at, I think around January, which is the delay, you'll start seeing the numbers go up because the assumption is a vaccine. Now, in no scenario do we have a plan for this to go back to the way it was at all in this fiscal year. There's very little doubt that it's going to be down even if there is a vaccine throughout the rest of the year as the effects of the pandemic continue to drag on and on and on. Uh, so you won't see that in that data on those previous pages that I gave you. But scenario A does assume a vaccine. Scenario B is like scenario A, but does not assume a vaccine. So those numbers that you see in A kind of flow out all the way to the end of the fiscal year. If I had to guess, I would say scenario B is probably 
the closest, but if we see another downturn or we see a rollback, you might be getting into the scenario C category there. So 12.2 for B, 14.3 for C, 16.4 million for scenario D in revenue shortfall. That leads to use of fund balance of 11.9 million all the way up to potentially $18 million of our $28 million in, or 26 million available, I guess, in fund balance. So a significant impact, and you can see the percentages. Right now we're at ending the last fiscal year at like 22.6%, I think it is. There's a slide in here that has it. So 22.6%, our best case scenario has that pretty much cut in half down to 11.2%. So let's look at it from a cut perspective. Assuming there's no revenue increases, uh, we don't have any expectation of that in the budget office at this point in time. So just to put this in perspective from a cut standpoint, everybody knows that the corporate fund is 80% personal services, people, jobs. What does that mean? Well, if we were to just take our salaries of 55 million across the corporate fund and we back out police, and we back out fire, and we back out the elected officials, and we back out the directors, that leaves $17.4 million for everybody else. Assuming you laid off everyone, which of course we won't do, this is just for illustrative purposes, but assuming you laid off everyone else besides those groupings, in September, which is halfway through the year, you're talking about an impact of $8.7 million. A little bit more when you throw fringes and stuff in there, but $8.7 million. That doesn't even reach the impact of scenario A. So the message is, if we're going to do cuts, and the and, and if the policy in the end the policy is, and this is what the folks around the horseshoe are, are to tell us, the policy is to try and preserve fund balance, or at least preserve it up to a certain point, whether it's 16 percent, 20 percent, whatever the case is, eight percent is the minimum per council ordinance. Whatever our directives are, cuts are likely going to be needed. Um, and they're likely going to have to impact every single department. The numbers right there tell you exactly why that is. All of the, the money is in, uh, most of the money is in, in two of our departments. Um, and one of the things that makes this more difficult is you look at headcount. This is in your budget book, but you look at headcount. Over the last 10 years, every single department, except for, I believe, the fire department, is down in staff. The city has worked hard to cut staff, to streamline, to get more efficient over the last 10 years so that we could get ready for the next catastrophe. It was never a matter of if, it was a matter of when it was going to come. So we collectively, council, mayors, staff, have worked hard to try and build up that fund balance to try and bolster those reserves so that when the time came, we would be ready. And it has paid off for the city in doing that as you'll see here as we've talked about, but that comes at, uh, at an expense, an expense of personnel. We had to get smaller, we had to get leaner. We had no choice in order to do that. And you can see on this chart that we've done that in virtually every single department, making the challenge that much more difficult. If you're talking about trying to do cuts that do not impact personnel at all, here's the other operating lines. Uh, without or less mandatory transfers like to Oak Ridge and the library and Fund 95 and nine, Fund 94. It's $19.4 million total budgeted. We've already spent 5.1 million. We've got another 2.1 million that is um, uh, obligated. That leaves us $12.2 million available. So I guess if we cut every single expense, utilities, paper clips, paper, contracts, you could, you could get there, but obviously we can't operate and provide services if we do that. So again, a very challenging situation to try and cut to get to the level of where we would need to be in order to deal with the impact of the pandemic on, on revenues. So here's the overall P&L that we have. I highlighted just a couple of things. Obviously, I won't go through the whole thing. But on the far left, you see the fund balance I referred to, $28.1 million, I believe is what that says. That is the highest fund balance we've ever had in the fiscal year. It certainly comes at a good time, right before the pandemic has helped us, as we talked about earlier. And then you see the next one over, we had um, 1.6 million already budgeted, as you'll remember, for uh, the police contract and other rollovers 
that didn't happen last fiscal year, so that was already part of the plan. And then you have the scenarios next to it. So you can see the impact going across as the scenarios get progressively worse, what the impact is on the, uh, the net performance, operating performance, and use of fund balance, and how it goes all the way down to scenario C is what, 8%, 6.5%. Now the one thing I will say, and I already said it earlier, but I'll, I'll reemphasize is that there are no cuts yet reflected in this. We will update this chart when we come up with a cut plan, and those numbers will improve once we do that. And also, there no CARES Act, no Cures Act in there as of yet. Again, we should get something out of that, uh, maybe a couple hundred thousand, maybe more. And also, one of the things, it's the next slide, if I can get to it, here we go. Obviously, from day one, we sent out a memo to all the departments telling them to stop all discretionary spending, spend only what you need to operate at a bare minimum. Provide services, make sure you do that, but do it at a bare minimum. Try to slow down hiring, do what you can, and right now, we're pacing at 3.2 million under last year, but 2.7 of that was just timing of pension payments, so. There we go, sorry. Did you cut my mic off? No, you're getting close. Okay. <laughs> I knew I, 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 knew, I was figured I was on the time limit. I didn't know it was that bad though. Uh, it's like the executioner. You pass the button around to somebody, it's all anonymous, but uh, anyway. So we're pacing under last year, which is, it's a testament to our staff that they're doing everything they can to control spending. So we do expect to have a natural lapse in expenditures. So the numbers on the previous page won't be as bad. We might have a one or $2 million lapse. The issue is that a lot of the laps that we typically get is from not hiring, from not filling vacancies. We only have 10 vacancies in the corporate fund right now. That's it. I thought it was more, but we checked it today and it's only 10. So there's not gonna be, and three of them are in my department with fiscal officers that we, we've got hiring on, on hold for. So uh, there'll be some money there, but not as much. So we might get a million or two million in, in natural laps to go with it to help those numbers just a tad bit. Real quick, other funds besides corporate, obviously there's a pretty significant impact to Convention and Visitors Bureau to fund 21, potentially up to a million dollars or so hit to there. They're funded entirely with hotel motel tax. That is an issue we are monitoring very, very closely. In fact, we were just looking at cash flows before we came up here. And uh, depending on the impact, we, we might have to have a conversation about that fund here in the, in the future. Oak Ridge Cemetery, as you know, is funded with Hotel Motel, 1%, uh, half a million dollars. That's going to be impacted. We'll have to make a decision on how much we can cut out of there. It's gotta be something. Whether or not we can take that 500 and make it 250 to match the 50% reduction, I'm not sure we can do that so that they can operate. We might have to just uh, suck it up and, and provide a little bit more than that, even though it's out of resources other than hotel and motel tax. Our capital improvement fund is impacted by sales tax and it's impacted by uh, video gaming as well. So there's a significant impact there. It could be two, three, four million dollars, depending on how long this drags out. Our motor vehicle parking fund was already in trouble. We provided a subsidy for it going into this year to help it keep operating as we tried to figure out what we wanted to do with it. And we've already spent a lot of that subsidy because we haven't been collecting fees and parking meters for, for many months now. And uh, nobody's parking downtown. So obviously there's a, a pretty significant impact there that we'll probably be coming back to the council and looking for some type of uh, a further subsidy for that fund in order for it to continue to operate. And I'm not gonna read this. This is just from COGFA's report in 2020, uh, Commission on Government Forecasting and Accountability. I thought this was an interesting passage. It, it really illustrates the uncertainty that we're facing and what could happen and what's happening elsewhere. So I'll let you read that in your leisure. Other than that, I am finished. And if there are any questions, we are here to try and Alderman, answer them. Alderman Redpath and Alderman Donald. Director, thank you for the report. Unfortunately, we had to, uh, we're taking a hit, but uh, so during the budget session, we uh, we approved specific uh, expenditures for, for for big equipment types of stuff. Is that all cut out of the, there? Are we not made those? I don't know purchases? how much. We, most of the equipment we did was last year. Um, okay. We did that loan through, and uh, I don't think we're buying a whole lot of equipment right now. What about uh, contracts and stuff like that? That, that uh, is there contracts that we can stop or? Alderman, everything is under review. We have empowered the departments to go through each of their budgets with a fine-tooth comb and ask them to 
preserve as much as they possibly can. The mayor has instructed them to run cut exercises up to 10%, so they're all well aware and should be well aware what's in their budgets and what can be cut out. And contracts would be one of those items, if possible. And my final question is that we know that we, we're going to have to dip into the fund balance to uh, try to help us get out of this hole. Mm -hmm. And we did pass an ordinance that says we couldn't go under 8%. Correct. correct. If we get into the situation where we have to go under 8%, we can do that through a vote for, by the city uh, council. Is that uh, that's a question for Corporation Council Circle, but I assume that you could. The one thing I want to emphasize, if I didn't in, during the presentation, and I should have, what I presented tonight was just for this fiscal year. It is not representative next year. This will not be over at the end of this fiscal year. No, it's going right. to drag forward, and we're going to have to be thinking about diminished revenues going into the next fiscal year as early as October when we start the next budget session. So what you're seeing not is not, so when I say scenario D, that's scenario D for this fiscal year. It has nothing to do with next year. So we go into that, let's say, we, let's say we don't do any cuts and we completely wipe out the fund balance. Going into next year with diminished revenues and increasing expenses, we're gonna be really behind the eight ball to try and balance that budget. It's going to require major cuts or new revenue. It's to April 1, is that correct? April 1 or April 3rd? February 28th. Oh, February 28th. All right, thank you. And as a reminder, that's why the council passed that policy ordinance uh, between 8% as the floor and 16% as the ceiling. And uh, thankfully we didn't spend down the uh, fund balance, which we could have, but we left it uh, healthy at, uh, I think you said 22%. 22. And so that's a significant um, level above the 16% that helped cushion this year. It's not very good at all, but uh, we'll continue to move in that direction of uh, cautionary spending. Alderman Donlin. Thank, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Director, for the update. Uh, did you, could you, did you? ever imagine that we would be in this situation? No, I don't of think any not. of us did. Right. And, and uh, this is the, these are truly unique times, uh, hopefully times that we'll, we will, we and or our children or grandchildren ever experience again. And uh, quite frankly, I expected the numbers to be kind of where they are as far as uh, what the shortfall is in revenue. And, and uh, you outlining the fact that it is a revenue problem not ex as far as what caused it is very important <laughs> for everybody to understand. Um, what I, of course, you know this, but uh, what I wanted to point out is it's important to understand that the council has a fiduciary responsibility to pass spending authority or pass a budget based on projections that were provided. And unfortunately, those projections uh, have proved not to be accurate because of the COVID situation. And now that we're in this uh, predicament, um, my understanding and what I heard you say this evening is, and I'm glad you said it, is the staff is going to come, the staff and the mayor are going to come to the council and uh, let us know what the cut plan is. Uh, because uh, you're not asking for additional revenues. I'd never heard that. You don't know if state or federal monies are going to be possible. And it doesn't sound like it's going to be uh, some significant number, meaning one that would fill the, fill the hole. Right. So do you have a feel for, now that you know the numbers and now that we've talked about them publicly, when you'll be prepared to come to the council and at least apprise us what the administration's plan is to, to uh, make sure that we're as, as uh, far in the black as possible, we less have, in the red. We have been having ongoing discussions with the departments, and now that the mayor has the numbers, uh, we're going to be meeting very soon to talk about a plan of action. Once we have that, I'm quite certain that the mayor will be reaching out to the council members. Well, as, and, and I know you know this, but I'm just going to say it, uh, Julie Zogadar and your staff always pointed out to me, the longer you wait when you have expenses uh, uh, going along as is, <laughs> the worse the hole is. Absolutely. So uh, obviously we, we need to hear what your plan is as soon as possible. And uh, the, it's, it sounds like there could be opportunity for some uh, creative things to be done that would involve the council, but it's really the responsibility of your staff to come up with uh, some scenarios and, uh, and let us know what the plan is. Because obviously, when you have a budget that 80% uh, is people, uh, it impacts people's lives, not only that work here, but the services that people expect. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the update this evening. I know you wish that the numbers were completely the opposite of where they are, and I anxiously await uh, hearing what the plan is. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, a couple things that everybody can work on is uh, we are allocated based on our population $4.8 million in CARES Act funding, but the way the state structured it, it's more of a reimbursable, 
And so uh, it doesn't uh, count for lost revenue. It's, uh, I think, uh, Director McCarty spoke to it might be a hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand. Well, that's not to the level of significance that we've been impacted. Right. And so we'll continue to push that. And so all of us know legislators through the state house, and uh, it's important that we educate them on that aspect. Uh, the other side of it is um, we're asking that the Illinois Municipal League they did put forward legislation that would push out the ramp for the police and fire pension like you would refinance your house in times like this. It's no different for the police and fire pension. You push it out 10 years, and I imagine that's probably a $5 million savings through all for our city, I would think. That's a projection, but that's something we'll run the calculation. But that's important to, uh, we maintain our obligation to pay it, but it's a time that we could lower our payment uh, in these dire times and it would benefit all cities. So everybody should be pushing for that, especially when you have the state and the feds not really uh, doing direct um, allocations to the municipalities. So you got this filter effect happening and it's just like it's filtering down and the pile gets smaller and smaller and smaller and that's what we get this, you know, it's a trickle down effect. I think that was someone's uh, uh, economics theory at one point in time. Uh, but we're not a firm believer in that. I think it's important that we all communicate that through all levels of government, and we'll continue to push on the federal level, on the state level, but it's important that all of us uh, make sure we educate our representatives to that magnitude of both those initiatives because it's uh, not only important for Springfield, but it's important for all the uh, cities uh, throughout the state. Well, Marion, if I can, just to, mm -hmm. and, sure. and those are really good suggestions. The problem we have, well, part of the problem we have is they're not in session. It won't be until December. Mm -hmm. I think it's December, at least locally. Yeah, the ramp certainly would help that us would going help into next run. year's budget. Next year uh, sure, it, yeah. it won't do much for us this year, but it, it will help us for sure, no doubt. Mr. Mayor. Alderman Turner and then uh, Alderman Hanauer and McMenamin um, and then Rep. Pat. Thank you for the comprehensive report. It, you were shorter than I anticipated, but it was a lot of good I tried. information. <laughs> hey, in my defense, I told staff I only wanted seven slides. So you'll have to talk to Julie and Dallas about why there are a bunch more. Well, you didn't read all of them, so that. I know, I, I skipped over. <laughs> but, I wouldn't do that to you, older woman. <laughs> but um, I was actually gonna, Alderman Donlin uh, raised a point that I was gonna raise about coming with a plan for um, the, the process for for cutting and and I would hope that when the plan comes that it's a comprehensive comprehensive plan that we don't get it in piecemeal seg segmented that you know because it's very difficult to make decisions when we don't have you know the whole picture picture at one time so I would really suggest that we have a comprehensive plan when it does come understood Alderman Hanner, Thank you. and then Alderman McMinimum. <clears throat> Way back um, when I was at the state, we had a situation where we had a major funding issue, and uh, we went out to all the contractors, all the companies that did business with the state. In our case, it would be the city. And we told them we wanted a reduction on their contract cost, um, a voluntary, and if they didn't do it, we terminated the contract and we, we chose someone else. We have, um, we have uh, personal services contracts that do not have to be bid. This is a good time for them to, to pony up and say, and, and help us out on this. Um, you know, and if they don't, we need to look at other, other companies that, that are willing to help out. Um, I think this is gonna be all hands on deck Type situation where uh, we've got to look at look at you know all the contracts like Alderman Redpath said we got to look at all the contracts especially the no bid ones probably more than the bid and even but the bid ones we should go you know but the no bid ones the personal service should be number one and uh, you know I'm not saying you're going to get a ton of money out of it but if you know if you can get a million dollars out of it that's one twelfth of our our issue, and I'm and I'm talking across the board. It does, I'm talking utility. I'm talking, you know, um, you know all the other contracts that are out there. So I just wanted to bring that up. I, I think you. I agree with you 100. percent I will tell you. I can give you an, one example of where we we have done that. We worked with uh, our lead well provider, the clinic. 
to reduce costs drastically over the last several months because nobody was going out and nobody was going to providers. And so we worked with them and we were able to cut costs pretty significantly uh, through decreased uh, labor and expenses there. So we are looking at things like that and, and you're 100% correct. We're, we're looking at everything. Anything and everything that we can look at, we're, we're looking at it. And I appreciate any idea that anybody has. These ideas tonight, they're great. If you've got them, please, please send them our way. We would love to hear your thoughts, really would. And that would help us formulate the plan. Alderman McMinimum. Bill, thank you for this report and the staff work that produced it. Could we go to slide three, which is the sales tax slide? Slide three. The percentage one? Or the, doubt, the percentage one. Right, then it shows uh, some of the columns in yellow, which, as you indicated, mm -hmm. were actual numbers, and then the, the white numbers are projections going forward. My sure. question is, we've got two yellow columns at the top there, which is the state sales tax and the city sales tax. Right, for March and April. Mm -hmm. That's my question. So the the month of June and the months of June and July, those are the, the dates that we receive the distributions from the Department of Revenue from the yep. state of Illinois. June would be March, July would be the April sales tax. July is the one we were really waiting on. So June is March retail sales, essentially. Our sales tax versus budget, yes. We were down 13% versus expected budget. And the July reflects April sales tax activity in yep. April. So what that's saying is in state sales tax, we were down 21% versus what we had in the budget. And we don't yet have May. We um, do not. No, May will come at the beginning of August. That's the problem with this. And one of the reasons, primary reasons for the delay, sales tax is the biggest piece of the puzzle. We haven't had the information on that to be able to make any real decisions. We couldn't wrap our arms around anything with any kind of certainty without at least having April, without having that floor. So if you look at across scenario D, we took our April and ran it all the way across, assuming that was the worst, and then we worked our way back from there. Thank you. You're welcome. Other woman Desenzo. Um. Thank you, Director. I appreciate all this information, and I'm going to bring up the elephant in the room, and we're talking about staffing. Are furloughs being discussed? Um, are how many are being discussed? I remember previously, and Alderman Hanauer probably remembers this too, one, one year we had to take 24 furlough days. Um, that's over a month of pay, and I would hate to see that happen. So. You know, we have families that are in trouble. We have families that have lost, you know, one earner has lost jobs or, you know, so I'm, I'm just concerned about where we are with staff, furlough versus layoffs, that, that sort of discussion. Well, what I will tell you is, uh, I'll leave it to the mayor to talk about specifics, but I will tell you everything's been discussed, everything's on the table, whether it's furloughs, whether it's layoffs, whether it's other options. Everything is, is, is on the table, and we, I can't give you a specific number, one, because again, I'll leave it to Mayor to, to provide specifics, but number two, we have various scenarios that we've been working on, whether a 5% cut versus a 10%, that's a big difference. That's a lot of furlough days, or that's several more layoffs, whatever the case may be, duration. So we have to find the right mix on what we're going to do in order to, uh, to achieve the goals of trying to write the fiscal ship for this, for this year. Um, as you know, you can go a bunch of different ways. Everybody can do some furlough days or you could have refusal to do furlough days and then you do layoffs. I mean, there's, these things work in a lot of different ways and part of that is part of the collective bargaining process as well. So I really can't get into much of that uh, other than to say that we've talked about all of it. Thank you. Alderman uh, Redpath and Alderman Turner. Uh, Alderman Turner, you can go first. Uh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I, I noticed that there have been a lot of uh, uh, notices for hiring. So why are we why are we hiring people if we're in a situation where we're either going to be doing layoffs or furloughs, and we know we know that. So right. I, I don't. I, every a, time I get every time I get the email that there's a posting, I'm like, why are we hiring people when we know we're in this situation? That's a great question, and hopefully I have a good answer for you. 
So if you go back to the head, cart, head count chart that I provided, you'll see how much leaner we are these days. There's not a lot of redundancy built out there. So if a position can remain vacant without harming operations, it is remaining vacant. But if there's a critical position that needs to be backfilled because departments are so much leaner than they used to be, then departments have been allowed to go ahead and put forth that. And they provide an explanation as to why they need that position filled. So, and it's so, a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so all of the positions that we're hiring for are critical positions. That is my understanding. And usually there's a delay in hiring uh, with regards Natural. to that. The other thing where you are looking at is shared services. I believe there's uh, other areas of uh, that we can kind of maximize our resources by uh, consolidating like services, similar to what we did with the finance department. And so we'll be taking a look at that as well and improve, hopefully, uh, operational efficiency. Alderman Ripet. So, Director, there is a, you said there was requirements that are handed down of what we can and can't spend this money on. Uh, there was a, uh, a federal municipal relief package that was going through uh, Congress that uh, would have filtered completely down straight to the municipalities. Is that, is that still in the works, do you know? I don't know if that if there's something new in the works. What ended up happening with the federal money, the CARES Act, it ended up going, if you were of a certain size, and I think it was maybe originally a half a million for a city, 250 for a county, or I might have those reversed, it would go directly to you. But if you were smaller than that, it actually is filtered down through the states. And so that money goes to the state, and then it's coming <coughs> to us through the Cures Act, which has all those restrictions. That My question is directed towards how we could uh, reimburse the, the areas that we're, not, that we're being told we can't reimburse. And is that, is that a different package than what's coming down now? Uh, no, not that. I, I, what they're talking about now, I, I can't tell you in Congress. It's, they're having debates. They're having discussions. There's nothing concrete for us to really talk about because we don't know which way it's going to go. Uh, is there going to be $600? Is there not? Is there going to be this? Is there going to be that? What I can tell you is the money that's passed through has gone through the state to us. What we need to do, the mayor alluded to this earlier, is we need to try and press our state representatives, our senators, our representatives, uh, the governor, whoever, to try and allow more usage out of the money that we've right. been allocated. We've been allocated $4.8 million in Springfield, and right now, we only have enough to maybe access 100, 200,000 of it. Because it's not directly related to specific things in corona, but there are indirect expenses that have been caused by the corona. So, uh, we're, And we're going to try and capture all of that, everything that we can that's direct or indirect. The problem is, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, it is really a revenue issue. And they have been pretty steadfast in saying that they are not going to use this money to reimburse governments for lost revenue. Thank that's you. what really needs to change. Thank I mean, that's the answer. Thank you. Any other questions for Director McCarty? Very good. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a pleasant evening. And next, we have uh, Doug Brown give the uh, presentation of CWLP finance, finances. Okay, I'm going to give you uh, basically our first quarter here once we get it pulled up. Copies for the uh, clerk. I didn't know if the, oh, for the presentation <coughs> for the. Oh, there's none up there. I mean, there's not a. I emailed it today, though. I mean. Okay. I don't know if you can pull it up via email. Yeah, just wait a minute so we can pull that up for the monitors. What? Oh. I don't know. I think it was later than that then, because I didn't get a kickback. Uh, it was, okay. Yeah, she has it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Great. Thank okay, you. So this is uh, basically the months of March, April, and May. So our cash position for the utilities looking uh, for the electric side is looking really well. Um, 45 million in cash. It's 150 days of cash on hand for the electric side. That does include the restricted funds and the environmental fund of 21.5 million. Here you can see the <clears throat> cash by month over the last three fiscals in comparison. And then here's just the year end, uh, what, the, what the cash looks like at, uh, for each fiscal year end, and you can see how it's increased. And again, the Moody's is 150. We're just, this is just tracking uh, the internal calculation. So our, our retail revenues for the months, uh, you can see that we've had a, a, a hit here for revenues, um, both retail and wholesale sales. So that's really because of the effects of the electric market being down, as well as uh, COVID-related issues as far as, you know, with our loads dropping. Um, I will say, though, that uh, the summer months here being hot, you know, we've seen a return of our load. So hope, you know, we're gonna see some increase in revenues coming back. So that's gonna help curb some of the impact to the electric fund. Um, but we are gonna keep a really watchful eye on revenues and expenses. And then here you can see the revenues just comparison by month for the last three fiscals against the budget. And expenses are down, um, but again, you know, you see our revenues drop, so like wholesale sales are dropping, um, electric revenues are dropping. Uh, so part of that drop in expenses is, is also, the, you know, the, the power plant's not running, so there's less fuel that's bought. So that's all shown in expenses um, as being part of that. And then you have our expenses for comparison by month for the last three fiscals compared to budget. And here is our debt coverage ratio at year end, um, just the history of that. And this is really the, the main driver for our master bond ordinance for our covenants, you know, to be above the 1.25. This is what we look at. Um, you know, when we look at quarterly reports, which I'm gonna show you uh, soon here, that's not what we rely on. That's more of an internal use only. So here you can see our debt coverage ratio is at 1.29. Again, that's really because, uh, you know, our revenues are driven lower because of, uh, you know, the markets and of COVID uh, with that decline. And it also comes at a time where our expenses are usually higher uh, because of outages that are in like the springtime. That's usually the outage season. So our, if you look at the next chart, I'll show you. You can see that, you know, at the end of May, you're always going lower uh, during that time. And this is a chart that includes uh, the pilot. It does not include the Moody's, because that's what we have most of our history on is, is calculating with pilot. And then here is the environmental rebate fund. Uh, it's basically at 21.5 million right now. And then water fund, our cash position is 5.4 million and we're uh, due uh, with, to the electric fund of 2 million. Uh, Moody's days of cash is 54 uh, days right now. And uh, Moody's excludes renewal, uh, which is the 7.3 million, but it also includes rate stabilization uh, of 3.6 million, which we don't have that shown. Uh, so basically, if you include rate stabilization, uh, which I'll show, we'll talk about a little bit later, um, that can help correct some deficiencies with the uh, debt coverage ratio. <clears throat> so 
so then our water fund cash uh, by month over the last three fiscals. And then here you can see uh, how the, the days of cash have uh, decreased over the years. And that's mainly because that uh, when we went out for bonds early on for the waterworks infrastructure projects, the bonds weren't uh, obtained. So as the rate increases were rolling in, revenue drew, you know, drew up uh, increased cash levels to a point to where then when we started paying down the, or actually issuing the bonds and incurring the debt service, that started dropping the, the days of cash. And here you can see our water revenues are down 1.2 million. And part, there's really th three reasons for that. One is the power plants did not run all, much during this time frame. So you have 31, 32, 33 out. Unit four uh, wasn't running for a period of time. Uh, unit four does use a lot of water from the city. So that has an impact on the water budget. Uh, COVID obviously uh, had some effect on that as well as developer paid contributions are down. So that also affects our debt coverage ratio for the water. One thing that did help, I guess, with revenues um, that I just kind of want to point it out is that, you know, we've sold Chatham water uh, for 12 days so far this year and it brought in 228,000 uh, additional revenue. Last year was like 279,000 for 21 days and the year before that was like 151,000. So it's unfortunate, you know, that I guess they have issues of the South Salmon uh, Water District uh, with their, their plant, but it's actually a benefit for our water fund. So that helps out quite a bit. Um, expenses are down for water. I've obviously, if we're, if we're not selling uh, water, our expenses are gonna be down, chemical, less chemicals. And then we have a revenue comparison for water for the last three fiscals compared to budget. And then same with expenses. <clears throat> and again, you can see the year end debt coverage ratio uh, history for the water fund. And this is the, what is what we rely on. And then we have the debt coverage ratio for the water fund at 1.21. Uh, you know, obviously with, uh, it's a short term look at everything. So uh, again, with revenues down and expenses where they're at, we're gonna be short right now just in this short period. Um, but it's something that we are trying to control expenses as well. Um, cutting back on uh, equipment and other things. And then here you can see this, the history uh, a month by month over the last three fiscals uh, for the debt coverage ratio. And then here are our labor budget uh, for the water fund. Uh, you can see that uh, it really by, by not filling or waiting to fill vacancies, uh, oops, delayed. Um, water funds and uh, and you know and I guess increased by 0.3 million, and we're ahead in electric uh, by 1.5 million. I just kind of wanted to touch on this again because um, it's of its importance to the community, I think, for our customers with financial assistance. Um, through our commercial office, we've uh, added 600 customers to level pay or payment, uh, payment plans. Uh, we've reduced past due bills. Disconnections uh, were suspended again through the end of July. Uh, we wanted to go at least a month after we entered phase four. Uh, we've sent out letters, um, we've done social media outreach to our customers uh, trying to get them on a payment plan. And you know, to avoid disconnection going forward, they just need to call us, get on a payment plan. We will take everything into consideration, what their, you know, what their financial situation is, their hardships, um, all those things. 
an important thing is to get them on financial assistance. And with the LIHEAP uh, applications, they actually are reopening on July 27th for a complete new round of funding. And what we were able to do so far this year is increase uh, pledges for light heat for our customers of $67,000. So I think our, our, our group has done a really good job uh, with this. Uh, customers can contact uh, or actually go online for resources at COP.com and help IllinoisFamilies.com. Um, they can look at uh, contacting our commercial office either via our website, uh, through uh, calling or even emailing them. And then energy services offices numbers listed um, in, in case that they want to actually go ahead and try to maybe do some upgrades to their home to reduce their bills, that kind of thing. So our energy services office can really help with those, those, those things. So questions? Alderman <coughs> Redpath. Uh, Director, so uh, your financial assistance program is, it sounds like a pretty good deal, but there's absolutely going to be some people that probably aren't going to make it back. And if, if we got a plan on how we're going to help those folks somehow? I mean, the only thing that we can do is point them to the financial resources that they have available to them. That's what we're going to try to do. Is there a significant amount of people that are going to be in that position? I don't really have that information off the top of my head. Um, I think, you know, it's, a, it's really a case-by-case -case basis looking at what their issues are. Everybody's so much different. I mean, it's not, there's not just categories of them that all fit in one box. Um, but I think our group has been very flexible uh, in the past, making sure that everybody gets an opportunity to get on, on a payment plan. And on our debt coverage, back to that, uh, it, uh, Mr. McCarty was saying something about, uh, uh, or the mayor was saying something about pushing back the, um, the pension payments uh, to a certain point in order for us to be able to kind of recover on that. Is there a such, such a plan that we could look at the, you know, the electric debt uh, coverage to ask them to give us a little time or push that back somehow? Is that, is that something that's feasible? I, I don't think we would be able to do that with the debt service. Um, I mean, that's on the bonds itself. So that's not really a, an option to try to renegotiate that. Um, I will say on the water fund, though, I mean, we've, we're, we are refinancing uh, that this year. Uh, so that will help reduce debt service substantially. For the water side. For the only. water side. Um, and I would say the water is in worse shape. I mean, remember, too, we, I mean, on the electric side, we have 150 days of cash on hand. Right. So that, that is a, a huge positive. And I think, uh, you know, what we are going to do forward that you might see a little bit different in next year's budget is adding money into a rate stabilization fund. So what that means is that uh, for this year, it, we would reduce cash levels by, let's just say, just $5 million. Um, and we put that into rate stabilization, then we would be able to use that for next year or maybe the following year or whenever we would choose to help with debt coverage issues. Just looking for time to, you know, try to push things back in order for us to get back on our feet. Obviously, the general revenue side of our of our budgets uh, have got some problems coming. And uh, fortunately, we have, uh, fortunately, the utilities in a little bit better shape. Yes. And uh, hopefully that will uh, help uh, help us on that side of the, of the aisle. So thank you. Yeah, Alderman Donnelly. Director, could you just explain, uh, because we're going to get asked this question, whether it's by uh, organized labor, employees, or just general citizens. You know, we have obviously a $10, to $11 million shortfall in the corporate fund. We have 150,000, or excuse me, 150 days worth of cash in the electric fund alone. Why we can't use the funds from the electric fund to fill the corporate fund hole? <laughs> well, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything's set by ordinances. Um, the master bond ordinance, um, you know, has the what basically the the I guess the payment in lieu of taxes, the pilot, uh, what those are set at. Um, so there's there's not really a mechanism in place that allows that. Um, I think that you know you know we we have. It doesn't help because we've already done it in the past, increasing different things like shared services, payments, and those kinds of you know initiatives to try to uh, you know make sure where the utility's paying their fair share kind of thing. Um, but I don't really see that there's going to be a, a mechanism to be able to, to do anything with that cash. The other thing is is that um, even with the utility in better shape, uh, you know uh, 
there are other projects that are going to need to be done, like you know the ash ponds and those kinds of things that are out, hanging out there as well that we're going to be forced to do. Um, and we, not that we shouldn't be forced to do it; we should be wanting to do them. But um, but we we do have those things to consider as well. Thank you, Alderman Redpath. Director, uh, there's been some conversation about some other damage at uh, 33. Can you talk about that right now? Yes. Um, so I was actually going to say I got two more things after this, if we can okay. uh, quickly discuss them. So 33 update. Uh, so when they were bringing the unit up to speed last week, uh, we were excited to finally have unit 33 back. And uh, as they were rolling um, near synchronization speed, uh, a ground fault was detected in the generator. Uh, what that means basically is that there's a short in the windings. So they, we had our people pull the, I say the, the dog house off the generator so we could get access to it. Uh, brought GE in, they did a quick inspection and said that basically this was on Saturday, that it has to be pulled. So they're gonna have to send it back to the shop and see what is wrong with it um, to, to figure out where the, the short is. What this means um, is that, of course, there's a longer delay, but we don't know what's wrong with it exactly. We don't know if it's something that GE caused in the repair. We don't know if it was caused by the incident um, or if it was something that was just hanging out there that we, we were never able to detect until uh, you know, the thing was moved out, brought back into place. So there is exposure, to, from my point of view, um, that if it's not found to be GE's fault and it's not found to be covered by insurance by the incident, then we could be looking at that exposure. So I've asked GE to provide us with all the costs to uh, basically transport it, inspect it, find out what it would cost for a complete rewind. Um, I can't really ask them for an estimate of a, of a partial rewind because we don't know what that is, um, not until they open it up and inspect it at the shop. Um, and then uh, basically a cost to reclose the unit. So once we have those costs, I'm gonna talk with the mayor. Um, we're gonna meet with the plant staff and uh, figure out a plan. Now I will say though that um, if we were to, you know, it's, it's not my decision, but um, things that we're gonna have to consider is that if we were to consider saying, okay, well, we're not gonna risk repairing 33 and we're gonna run 31, 32, there is cost to doing that for 31, 32 to keep them running for another year because there are certain things that we've not done thinking that those units are shutting down that, you know, like for instance, air heater, the air heaters are plugged. So, you know, not too much longer, those units will be forced to shut down because there, there'll be too much pressure drop across the unit. But it's more expensive than, you know, for us to go clean it. But why are we gonna spend that money if the units aren't gonna run past the summer? Because of prices. So those are the kinds of things we're gonna have to weigh moving forward. So who did the initial inspection to find out what the damage was to that unit? And if they did the inspection, how did that get missed? Yeah, so, you know, with GE, uh, they were able to do inspections, but the windings are they're wrapped, so it's, they're all internal. So they didn't, there's no, they didn't take apart the windings. We didn't rewind the generator. Um, there's no way for them to test it. So, so they're not, it's, you know, we didn't see it until they did a test that was static with it not moving and there was no grounds detected. So when this thing is put back in place and it's spinning at 3,600 RPM, well, almost, um, basically that's when the short happened. So that there was really no way to detect it before that. When did we find this out? Um, they got the ground, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday of last week. Um, then our people spent time then to, to take the doghouse off and, and they were able to get the GE experts, so they call wind, winders, um, brought in Saturday to take a look at it. And if we send it back to GE for, for them to give us this estimate, what's the time frame for that? We, I, I don't have all that information yet. I'm still waiting on that. I'm hoping that we'll have all the final stuff tomorrow. Mr. Mayor. Alderman McMinimum, then on the, same top, on the same topic, did the generator leave our site? Yes. The rotor. Okay. And it's it's the uh, including the windings around. Yes. The, 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 yeah. It's part of the mm -hmm. generator. Yes. And then when it came back and we did the uh, startup procedures, that's when we detected the fault. Correct. Thank you. Alderman Donna. Just as a follow up, and this is 
not an engineer, so bear with me here. But when GE was looking at what happened and obviously looking at the entire unit and probably making some recommendations, did they make any recommendations regarding what, what you, I think, called a rewinding or? Y yes, they would. They will make a recommendation. Well, they will make a, uh, an estimate for a full rewind. Now, if there's a way when, they, when they've taken it apart and they can see that, oh, we can get to this piece and they can just fix this individual winding, um, then it be, could be much cheaper. But they can't really give us a cost for that until they see what's going on. But I mean, like, I'm just trying to, you know, you were talking about whether it was GE that did something or what have you. Did they make any recommendations to the, to the city on what should be done as far as the winding or? <clears throat> well, um, I know they did repair a little bit of the windings on the ends on the. Um... Yeah, when it was down in Houston, or excuse me, in Dallas, they made some repairs to uh, the road, the rotor of the generator, uh, which is where we're seeing the ground fault now. So they did make some recommendations that they did make the repairs on while it was down there. And now we're seeing this uh, fault. So there, there, there could be a chance that it, it is their fault for what for the work they did. That's what I was getting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe it's me, but why wouldn't they try to spin that thing down there before they bring it back here to find out that there's problems? Because now we, we deal with the cost of shipping it back and all that. To me, they had it. They were fixing it. They should have to. They should have done that. I don't know if they're. They have the machine. John, do you know if they have the yeah, machinery to be able to spin it at three six hundred RPM? It's not running during the hot months. Well, but they, you know, they, they would do a high speed balance if they add weight or take weight off the rotor. But since they didn't do that, they did not do it with a high speed balance, which then they could have wrote, spin it up to three six hundred and done that testing. But since they didn't do any additional weights or add weight to the rotor itself, is why they didn't do that. And this that's, is that's not untypical. And so, are, are, uh, this will not be covered by insurance? Is that what we're thinking here? I don't know. I don't know that because now the insurance company, they didn't recommend what John was saying that the, the unit be spun. So they usually, there's usually, they don't anticipate any kind of issues caused to the generator from this kind of a hard stop to the turbine. So that's why they didn't recommend those 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 kinds of. That and kind we of don't work. have. Do you, do you have any type of an idea, of kind of a ballpark, what, what you're thinking? This, the, you know, it, you know, worst case, I mean, worst case, it, what it's going to cost us? It could be a half a million. It could be a million. I, I don't know for sure. It depends on what the, the overall issues are with it. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I got one, one more thing. Yep. So I guess this is kind of a good note. Maybe, maybe not so much. Depends how you look at it. <laughs> um, but uh, it's not often you have two division heads that are going to retire at the same time. So I just want to take some time to acknowledge a couple of retirements, recognizing Ted Meckes and John Davis for their years of service to City War Light and Power. Both are retiring August seventh. Of this year. John will have 33 years in and Ted will have almost uh, 34. John began as a maintenance engineer for CWP in 1987. Then he served as supervisor of generation on to superintendent of production, then power generation director before taking over as electric division manager. Besides oversight for all the electric operations at CWP, including ISD and security, he stepped up and serves as our go-to guy for labor relations to help many departments beyond the electric division. He's taken on many leadership roles, not only with the IRP as of late, but also in the areas of safety, training, and general operations, always taking a no-nonsense approach to address and solve problems. Ted began as an engineer for the water treatment plant in 1986, then served as project manager, going on to assistant general superintendent of water treatment, then general superintendent of water treatment before his current role of water division manager. He has taken on leadership roles in the water, Illinois water industry and regularly serves as an expert and voice for uh, all the water utilities across the state. Ted has raised the bar in obtaining grants and loans for the water plant improvements, infrastructure, and watershed protection. 
He never shies away from a challenge, in particular, when it comes to standing up for water quality and water treatment. And he's a voice that's been listened to for multiple state and federal rules due to his experience and trusted expertise. It goes without saying, in their years, they both have went above and beyond with their roles in numerous significant capital improvements projects uh, while ensuring day-to-day -day operations. Uh, <clears throat> during their tenure in leadership, CWP's safety program has seen some of the best results in the industry. Accidents and workers' comp costs have been drastically reduced, and more employees are going home safe because of that. I would like to thank them separately, but they chose to retire together. <laughs> Just like they went to school together, high school together, then off to college, John always following wherever Ted goes. <laughs> <laughs> Ted came to the water plant in 1986, then John followed uh, to the electric plant in 87, then they became in charge of their respective plants, then, came, then Ted came to work downtown, then John. So in essence, these two can't stand to be too far apart from each other. <laughs> I don't know how they're gonna do it in, uh, in retirement though. Well, all kidding aside, uh, Ted, thank you. John, thank you. Um, I wish you the best in your future. Um, I would like to give them an opportunity to address the council uh, just briefly and then offer you the same if you have any words. Is this their last meeting? I this will probably be their last meeting. What? It looks yep. like a roast. Or and, unless you put stuff on debate. Yeah, we'll put it on debate. <laughs> That'll be good. Yeah, come on up. John, you want to be first this time? We well, said uh, John Falls Ted, so. We can see you. Yeah, John followed me from grade school, high school, college, and CWLP is like a bad cold. Can't get rid of him. <laughs> um, it's hard to believe this day's come. You know, 34 years with the city, CWLP family. Um, I want to thank them all. It's, it's been a great career for me and my family. The citizens of Springfield should be grateful for the hard work and effort that goes into providing high quality and great tasting drinking water. Um, I see these commercials all the time about thanking the healthcare workers, the restaurants, the hardware store workers. They should add the water providers to that. Our water providers at our water treatment plant, our water distribution, that team, they stay healthy, sacrificing their um, freedoms, like many of others, to continue to provide each and every one of us drinking water every day. That's pretty special. So I, I want to thank those people. Um, I also want to thank them for supporting me during my tenure as water division manager. At times, John, I, and Doug take our lumps up here, right? Um, but we want every one of you to realize we, ha we, as well as the rest of the city departments, have the city of Springfield at our heart. And their, their best interest in, is at our heart. Um, we think of ourselves as a team, the council, the mayor, city of Waterline and Power, public works, fire, police, we're a team. We all have the interests of Springfield are at our heart. Just remember that. Um, I'm sad to leave, but I'm excited for my future. Um, I am leaving you in great hands. Mr. Todd LaFountain, the superintendent of water treatment will be my replacement. Very smart person, be nice to him. <laughs> Just be nice. He's a good guy. Um, I, I do want to thank you. I appreciate all the time I've spent up here. Well, <laughs> I appreciate some of the time I've spent up here. Um, and all I know is I have no more foils. <laughs> I guess my name is Bill. We could say the last three three years has been Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. <laughs> but uh, since it's not, it's John and Ted's, I would say. But uh, I have known Ted since you know we were five years old, you know, from Christ the King to Griffin to Marquette and stuff, and now CWP. It's been a great opportunity to work with you, Ted. I appreciate everything you've taught me over the years. I also want to thank all of CWP, the electric division, the, especially the generating division, because I spent you know, 28 years at the generating division, at the power plants, and it's a great group of people and wonderful people to work with. I've met some incredibly intelligent people, good friends that, you know, I hopefully will have forever. Uh, so I thank them all. I thank Doug for giving me the opportunity a few years ago to come down here and kind of expand my knowledge on, on what I've done and things. But I really want to thank my family because I think that's the most important thing. My wife's put up with a lot over the last, you know, 27 years that we've been married. 
I missed a lot of holidays, a lot of Christmases, a lot of birthdays, a lot of you name it. I was at that power plant working most of those days, and she put up with me through everything that I had to do, and I really appreciate her for that. But, uh, you know, kind of like Ted said, it's been, it's been fun coming up here every Tuesday night for the last five years. Um, at times, uh, all in Hanar, and you and I, uh, maybe we'll see you at the Y once in a while, we can have those discussions more, but uh, it, it's been a great place to work. The one thing I will ask, my replacement's not announced yet, so I can't say be nice to him, because I'm not sure who it's going to be. But I really wish that you, you treat them, like I said, with the respect that they deserve, because all of us always have the best interest of the, of the ratepayers in our hearts. Every time I've been up here talking about an ordinance, I'm not doing it for anything but what I think is best for the ratepayers, because they're the ones that are important. We all feel that way. And trust the people that you have in front of you. You know, we, we've been in this business a very long time. We fully understand what we're doing. Trust them. When they say something, believe what they're saying, because... Uh, they do have the interests of the city, the city of Springfield at their heart. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you. Doug, we'll put you some on do? the bait next time. <laughs> Chair will entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the July 7th, 2020 regular city council meeting and move through the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council first reading of ordinances in the record of this city council meeting. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda in the record of this city council meeting. I'll move. Second. Okay, move and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. The chair will entertain a motion to place the consent agenda on final passage. So move. Second. Okay, move and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The clerk will now call the roll. Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Aye. Alderwoman Turner. Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. Aye. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman DeCenso. Yes. Alderman McMiniman. Aye. Alderman Connolly. Alderman Donnellan. Aye. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. Nine yeses and no and one. So consent agenda passes. Agenda numbers 20, uh, 2017 136, 2020-2026, 2019-004, 2020-067, 2020-134, 2020-153, 2020-181, 2020-192, 2020-207, 2020-218, 2020-229, or I'm sorry, 2020-27 remain tabled during committee. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to uh, remove 2020-275 for discussion. Second. To remove, what was that number again? 2020-275 for discussion. 275. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. So, um, go ahead. Alderman Gregory. Uh, Mayor, I uh, move to uh, remove 2019-276 from uh, consideration. It's been, it's been there for a while. 276? 219-276, yes, sir. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. <clears throat> Motion carries. So 2019-276. Yes. No, I'm, I'm removing it. Um, oh, you're going to remove it? Yes. Uh, okay, I thought we were adding it. Yes, okay. Yeah. He's making the Chris Tyler move. Thank you. Right. Out of here. Any <laughs> other uh, action on that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, first item is 2020-275. Do you have that, Corporation Council? Yep. Thank you. 
That's an ordinance amending the, uh, Chapter 37, Article 6 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as relating to the Deferred Compensation Committee. So there's discussion, you said? Oh, Alderwoman uh, DeCento. Yes, um, I think we want to take this off the table and move forward with this. I think there might be an amendment to this uh, to be discussed, but we are getting the general consensus that the individuals involved, the uh, bargaining units involved, want this to move forward. So I think we need to go ahead and move forward on this. So just remove it from the table, and then are you going to amend it tonight or wait, leave it in committee? What's the... Alderman Donlin. Yeah, I don't know if this is the amendment you were referring to, yes. Alderman Woman, but uh, the only thing for consistency, I noticed this last week when we were looking at it, if those of you do have Exhibit A in front of you of the uh, ordinance, 37.50B, uh, as in boy, um, does say the, the committee shall consist of eight members appointed by the mayor. I just thinking for consistency's purpose, we should add the language with advice, with advice and consent of the city council. And then in 37.52 under C, it says enter into participation agreement subject to written approval by the mayor. And I think it should say with advice and consent of the city council. That way it's consistent with most of our other boards and commissions and we're in the loop, that's all, so. Second. <clears throat> and I have not talked to okay. any, I didn't know this was really gonna come out tonight or I would have spoken with. Oh, that's all. your amendment, I'll yeah. second it. <laughs> That is my amendment. The move and second to add the, uh, with the advice and consent of city council in both those places. Any discussion on that? This is on the, on the amendment. Right, on the amendment. All in favor say aye the amendment. Aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. The amendment passes. Alderwoman Turner, did you have anything you wanted to add or? Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I did, but it, never mind. Okay. Alderman Redpath. So uh, the reason we probably put this on the table last week was there's some confusion about how this, what this ordinance is really going to do. And I think we probably need to hear from uh, Director McCarty uh, to explain this. Uh, there, was some, there was some concern about, uh, not necessarily just the unions, but it was concerned by employees in general that were consolidating the deferred comp uh, opportunities down from a certain amount down to one. And I'm not quite clear on that, so I really like a, an explanation if we can get that. And then I also believe that there's some people here that would like to address this before we vote on it, Mayor, if that's, sure. if that's possible. Okay, Alderman, I'll try to clear it up. Uh, most of what the Deferred Comp Committee does is pretty routine, boring stuff. Our meetings are typically five minutes, ten minutes. I don't minutes. think I'm addressing the committee itself as much as I'm addressing what this ordinance, what we are doing with the RFP that's going to... Right. Be okay. Well, the ordinance and the RFP are kind of two separate things. The ordinance came, I think, because of the RFP. So the ordinance, as I understand it, is the mayor is looking to make the Deferred Comp Committee similar to the same structure as the Health Care Committee, where we have equal parts management and uh, labor on that to have the discussions and make decisions. In reality, there's ex very few decisions to ever be made. This issue came up, the RFP came up because we were approached uh, by a vendor who wanted to do a presentation to us. The vendor did the presentation to us, and the long and the short of it is, clearly explained and illustrated to us that by having our segmented, uh, the, the five different providers, which is extremely rare uh, from governmental units to do that, but by having that, our members, the people that are in the program are actually paying more than a million dollars a year in fees that they shouldn't be paying. Okay. Because by segmenting the assets out amongst a bunch of different ones and not looking at this, as routinely as we should. We haven't looked at it in 10, 15, 20 years. Things change, the world of investments has changed. She was able to illustrate to us that if we were to consolidate or look, maybe go down to two or something like that, that our, the people that are paying would save a ton of money that stays directly in their accounts. So what she was able to do is illustrate because she did her own sort of mini RFP this is what she does for a living and reached out to some different nationwide financial groups and said, if you have assets of 80 million or so, which is what we have total and combined, what would your fees be? We have some of our providers, the average fees between the investments and what they're charging, they're called the record keepers, 
what they're charging is in excess of 2% per year. Whereas the consolidation we are looking at in all likelihood fees somewhere in total of around 0.4%. Is that the cost is directed to the employee or to? It's the employee that pays that cost. Okay. The city is. The city just sets this up. Everything is on the employees that participate. All we were trying to do was look at what our members, what our participants could save by participating in a program that's consolidated. Nothing has been etched in stone and nothing is 100% going forward. We simply wanted to do an RFP to see if what she said is accurate or not. And so we have the RFP, but no, there, there was no guarantee we were going forward. This is a test to find out. And we believe that she's correct because of all of the information provided. So all we were trying to do is say, our participants are paying a lot more than they should be. It's not me, it's Gene's members, it's his people, it's the cops, it's the firefighters, it's all of us that participate, anyone, if any of you do. You're paying more than you need to. That's what we're looking to rectify. That's the purpose of the RFP. It's not to cut anyone out. It's not to direct the business to any one particular firm or anything like that. Uh, I've heard some wild rumors. It purely is about saving money for the members because they can pay. If you have, think about some of these accounts. If you saw some of these accounts of what people have, it's $100,000, $200,000, $300,000. 2% of that per year versus half a percent per year. That money adds up over 10, 15, 20 years. It's a significant amount of money that our members can save if we were to proceed with this if the numbers work out the way that we think that they'll work out. This is for the participants. This has nothing to do with city administration. So I, we're all for trying to save money for our employees because this is uh, basically their retirement. Um, the vendor came to us and did we write an RFP specifically for this vendor or did we nope. put an RFP out? We put an RFP out and we invited all of our current vendors as well as any other vendor. Uh, you're looking at large you're looking at large companies here. This isn't going to be a local company, a small company or anything like that. You've got to be a big company to be able to do this, nationwide type company. So all, all of our vendors that we currently have were invited immediately to participate. And we also put it out there for other you know, large investment houses that are across the country. So is That's the, the intent. Is, is the contract been, is, is, did we have a winner of the RFP? Or? RFP is due this week coming up. So we I don't. I think maybe Thursday. How many people are, are, is there more than one company involved that's bidding on this? Well, we don't have all the bids in as of yet. They're due on Thursday. My guess is we'll have several okay. to choose from. That's and what's going to be interesting is, we, you know, all, we hope all of our current vendors put in for this because it really will be an, a, an illustration of I, when you line them up, what we're paying now versus what we could pay under a consolidated, the numbers will be staggering. I mean, our people are paying more than a million dollars a year in fees. They don't have to. So is, and that's is, them, is, not is us. Is this something that can't be handled by institutions here in Springfield or does it have to be, uh, I mean, do we have people with the ability or, 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 or the status to be able to handle an RFP like this? Um, I don't think so. I think you have to be a, a pretty a national investment type house to do this kind of thing. I mean, it's $80 million in assets. So we, our expectation is to be some type of a national firm. And we don't care who. All we're trying to do is get the best price, the lowest expenses for the members that are participating. And, and That's the reason, all we care about. And the reason we held this up a little bit, Director, is because there was a lot of concern that there was a lot of non-information out to the employees that they didn't understand what was being going down. I, I received... Yeah. Dozens and dozens no, I of calls, I mean, and I'm sure. You, you know, any, Alderman, I, I totally get it. Anytime you're in government and something is the way it is for a lot of years, anytime you have a change in government, I mean, all of us, a lot of us have worked in government. We know how that can be a shock. And again, deferred comp is really boring. Our meetings are five or 10 minutes. You don't really do anything. You're just kind of going over. It, you're, you're pushing papers all you're doing. So when something like this comes along, and it's like, I mean, it was, I'll be honest with you, it was sort of like us getting whacked across the face when we got this presentation because we didn't realize it. And, you know, shame on us for not looking at this more often. But you get into a rhythm, you get into a rut, and things just go, and you don't realize the world around you has changed the way that it's changed. And our members can be saving a ton of money out of their accounts. Again, city saves nothing by doing this. We get nothing, we save nothing. All we're trying to do on the deferred, and the mayor, we brought, the mayor had nothing to do with this. We took it to him. 
All we're trying to do is our fiduciary responsibility as members of the committee to look at something that was brought to our attention to where we could save participants a lot of money. Is there any and that's other, all we're trying to do. Is there any other funds uh, similar to this type of situation that we should be looking at since we obviously woke us up? No, um, deferred comp. I mean, it's the it's the retirement for our for our employees. It's you know they, they put it's a 457b plan and. Uh, uh, certainly if there was something else, but it's like healthcare committee is a great example of, of how we collaborate and we look at it. And, and I will tell you, the presentation, the letter we sent out to everybody all at once, we wanted this, and I'm sorry it went this way, we wanted this to be the opposite of what it's turned out to be. We wanted it to be totally upfront and open and transparent. That's why we sent out the letter. Everything went out at the same time. The RFP went out, the letter went out, notice to the vendors went out, invitations to bid to the vendors all went out on the same day. We put in there, if you've got questions, please contact us. We are more than happy to sit down with you. We put in there, as soon as the RFP comes in, we're going to do group meetings to explain and show and illustrate how we can save money by doing the consolidation. Nothing is etched in stone because we haven't seen the proposals, but if they come in the way we think they're going to come in, then our employees should be extremely happy with what we're bringing to them. There's no subterfuge. There's nothing going on under the surface. This is purely about saving money for the people that are paying in their retirement fund. They can pay more or they can pay less. We assume most would want to pay less, but to do that, we have to modernize our deferred compensation program, and we have to or should consolidate, if not down to one, at least down to two. Five splits the assets up so much you don't get economies of scale, and you want to know a prime example of where this just is occurring right now? The state of Illinois with the consolidation of police and fire pension funds, taking all individual assets and putting them together. Why? To save money, to take advantage of economies of scale. This is the exact same thing. You can save money by bringing everything together, and that's what we're trying to do. Is this a bargaining issue? Not at all, that I'm aware of. And that's a question for Corporation Council. I think our job is just to provide the best uh, retirement opportunity that it is. Corporation but, Council? Uh, Zirkel? The, well, that's one of the reasons why the proposal was made to the uh, issue with the Deferred uh, Compensation Committee was to ensure uh, proper representation. And the, what, uh, what Bill is outlining is just really a request for information. You have to remember, an RFP is nothing more than a request for information. So uh, I think the uh, thought, the mayor's direction on this was that when the new committee is in place, then all of the information will be referred to that new committee so it could be discussed and determine whether or not it's worth either pursuing or how it ought to be, how it ought to go forward. And labor along with uh, uh, non-union employees will have a representation on that board? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're happy to have them. We're happy to have anybody that wants to sit on we the We just committee. want everything up on the no, table? No, and the health care committee has worked well, and we welcome this. I, I have no problem at all because I know when we sit down and we all collectively, uh, members of collective bargaining, uh, members of non-union, any employee, quite frankly, sits down and sees what I think we're going to see, it's, it honestly should be a no-brainer. But, you know, unless there's, you know, different... Uh, People had different agendas. Thank you. Hold woman Turner. Um, I think you, you, your last your last comment is is one of the reasons why I think there was so much hubbub about this because people didn't know what the agenda was. They didn't sure. know if there was an agenda. If someone had one, didn't have one, it was just like out of the clear blue. And when you're talking about people's retirement, that's that's a very special thing. Very sensitive subject. Very very special thing to be talking about, and um, I didn't see the correspondence that went out. I just got all the calls that came in, and the way that most individuals took it was that their, uh, their, their opportunity for choice was going to be stymied, and it was going to be cut off, and there was going to be the city making that decision for them instead of them being able to make that choice. And, you know, people who are at different stages of their career make different choices with regard to their deferred comp. Some people are much more aggressive than others, so people just want to make sure that they have that choice. And when you start talking about going down to one uh, vendor, then people's, you know, antennas really got, got raised. Uh, so, oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, so um, <clears throat> that was the reason why I asked several times that 
and I got the answer that the answer was no, that there was not going to be any decision, even though the RFP is due back on Thursday, it's my understanding, that, and this committee has not been populated yet, there will not be any uh, review or decision made with regard to an RFP until that committee is populated and has an opportunity to meet. Correct. The mayor has made that that uh, promise. I think last time when the, he said that uh, I know, no decisions will be again. made. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just, just verifying. Uh, <laughs> I believe he's going to stick with that answer, right, Mayor? I think yeah. we're going to stay with that. No. We, we, and again, I, we welcome. I mean, it's perfectly fine. It, mm -hmm. Feel free to move forward with it. We'll populate. We won't make any decisions. Really, it's going to be data driven from our perspective, and I think. The way that we've done the decision making on the health care committee based on data and actual information and how it impacts employees will carry over to the deferred comp. And once everybody sees the clear objective of what we're doing, I think it, I think it becomes a no-brainer at that point. But I agree with you 100%. There's been a lot of rumors, a lot of confusion. And that happens when you have change and something that hasn't changed in a while. To your point on choice. There would be a limitation on the choice of the provider if you're going down to one. but. These, the main choice people want is what can they invest in? And the nice thing about the way we've done it is the deferred comp committee will be the decider on how many investment options. We could have 10, we could have 200. Mm -hmm. It's really up to us. The vendor is just the record keeper. And that is, so you might have just one record keeper, but really the choice comes down to what can you invest in? We get to decide that, not the vendor. Right. and and. and and that's good information. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when when you send out, you know, just a form letter type missive, and people don't have the opportunity to, you know, ask those questions one on one, right. then the rumor mill starts right. going, and you know, then that's that's right. how we find our, well, ourselves when you here. But I think everybody is ready to move forward with it. So, great. Yeah, that's why I think that it was brought out tonight. Everybody's ready to move forward on it. But um, again, I just. Nothing happens until it's we'll, populated. We won't make any decisions until the committee is is repopulated, reformulated. Thank and you. I invite and I invite any any older person who gets these phone calls, please send them to myself or John Rogers, who's chair of the committee, or uh, Director Cousin. We're, we're happy to sit down with anybody, uh, whether it's Gene or members of you know under Director uh, Gene. Happy to do it. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, for Director for. Uh, just for clarity, who are the fret, what companies are the present uh, providers? Uh, let's see. We have AXA, Horace Mann, uh, IPPFA, I think. Uh, what is it? Voya. I'm trying to think. I think there's one more that I'm forgetting. So one's a local company presently, and at least three of those have local presence. Y yes, I think so. I think they have. Well, I mean, they have people around here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Alvin Hanauer. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, you know, I'm always a big believer of, of doing RFPs and any time we can bid right. something out. I think it's it it's just better for the citizens of, of Springfield. And in this case, I think it's probably a good good idea that we did this for the people that are in the plan. I guess I what I'm going to bring up is maybe we need to look at something in our procurement or ordinances to where we set a timeline where we don't allow long term where something has to you have to rebid something after five years contracts can't go 20 years without being bid um, you know and and I'm I'm talking all of contracts I think we really need to look at that because you know things change in five years look shoot just look at how much has changed in five months. <laughs> let alone five years. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that we need to, as a council, ought to, ought to really kind of look at that and try to try to maybe set limits on how long contracts can be, you know, four years with a one-year renewable or five years with a one-year renewable. That way, you know, if, we, if we're a little late getting, getting things started, we can still go with it. But I, I do think that that's something, and this is a perfect example where it sat there People, you know, the, the, I'm sure that the rates have climbed from 15 years ago or well, 10 years ago, well, whatever. So even if they've been static, the reality is investment rates have dropped precipitously over that time period. Look at the uh, TD Ameritrades of the world, the Schwabs and all that. Used to be, I don't know for you that have your own um, 
accounts that you mess around with, like I call play account or whatever. But uh, if you have those, commissions, I mean, I remember I was paying $15 a trade, $20 a trade. Now I pay zero. They've yeah. come down, and that's the way investments work now. And there's a lot of savings out there. It's changed how the fees are. So if you have something that was put in place 20 years ago and the fees haven't changed, you've been missing the boat for a long time. And I'll tell you, just looking at my own account and knowing what I'm paying now, which I didn't know before, I was shocked, yeah. very shocked. Thank you. And, oh, if I might add real quick, it's funny you should say that because we are actually, uh, the purchasing agent and I are working on an ordinance to have a time limitation mirrored after the state, the state has one, yeah. Uh, yeah. that everything has to be bid after a certain amount of time. I don't know if it'll be four years. We might bring you something a little longer than that, but you can always amend it if you want to, but we are working on something. I'll be happy to co-sponsor that one. So okay. I'll make minimum. We'll let you know. We'll let you take a look at it when we have something. Director, I think the goal of economies of scale and reducing commissions and fees for our employees is a worthy goal, but our employees don't like the disruption of changing their financial advisor. They have relationships with their financial advisor. They, have, they understand the mix of investments that that particular vendor provides. And so when we think about going to one vendor, we're, we're talking about disrupting. Let's say we've got a thousand employees participating in, in uh, deferred compensation. We're talking about disrupting a thousand employees with something different than what they have now. It's kind of like saying, okay, we, you like your dentist, but you're going to have to move to a different dentist. You may like your financial advisor, but we want you to move to a different financial advisor. That can be very disruptive, uh, even if there's an advantage on fees. Folks well, get it, familiar it, with their financial advisor, mm -hmm. with the specific mix of investments. So we have to be very cautious about this. And by the way, I don't recall that our participants in deferred comp were ever notified of this uh, change that's been begun by city government. I think the vendors may have been no, notified. They, they Maybe I missed the notice because I'm a deferred. You, you, uh, you missed the notice. It went out the same time. Everything okay. went out the same All day. Right. That's, that was good to do that. That was very yeah, good. Yeah, we wanted to be an open So the main point I'm making is that we have to be very careful about disrupting relationships. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree so with cautious, you. cautious, and I, Mayor, I think you're doing a good job by trying to get uh, more participation by our union personnel and so forth, and I think that's a good move. Yep. So, Thank and you're you. right. I, I completely understand that in the relationships. And all we can do is get the information in, lay it out, and then let the participants make the decision. I like my provider a lot. He and I get along well. But if we can, I go to a different firm, maybe his firm gets it, maybe it doesn't. If it saves me two, $4,000 a year in my retirement account over 10, 15, 20 years, I'd be okay with that. I could get used to somebody new. That's why as the OBM director, it's always about money, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thank Very you. Very good. So uh, is there a motion to uh, move for approval, or you want to leave it in committee as amended? Motion to move for approval. Second. Been moved and second to move for approval. Any discussion? All those, uh, excuse yeah, me. All did, did, did you want to direct us? Sure. Yeah. I mean, on, he, asked, sure. he asked to speak. I'm, yep. One o'clock. <laughs> Shorter speech than you gave us last time you heard, Jim. Uh, setting the RFP aside, because uh, that's for you the state your name for the. Uh, so my apologies, uh, Gene Thank Mitchell, you. Ward Six. I represent ASME, Council Thirty One employees, uh, both at the Water Department, Public Works, and then uh, downtown for MCE, Library, etc. Um, uh, putting the RFP aside. Uh, the, the big issue that first came about is, as you all have discussed, there wasn't a lot of information. It seemed to be a lot of the back end that our employees and our members were hearing about what was happening. And it was a big question of why are we not even being asked whether or not our members, because the Director McCarty is correct, it's our money. It's our members' money. So why weren't they even consulted about whether or not this is a good idea for them? Uh, in fact, what a lot of them tell me is, is that, yeah, my fees may be higher, but you know, I don't necessarily want to pay on the cheap for someone who's making sure my retirement is going to go well. Um, you know, I think I liken it to my wife. 
you know, she says, Gene, ketchup is ketchup. And I'm like, yeah, but Heinz makes it the best. <laughs> so I'm going to pay for Heinz, <laughs> you know. Right. And it's the same way with, uh, with, with deferred compensation. Sure. I want to work with someone based on my own criteria, not what someone else is designing for me. Maybe I want someone who works across the street at Horace Mann, and by the time I'm 55, 56, or if I'm like Ted Meckes and I'm leaving, I may want to just walk across the street and talk to somebody, as opposed to maybe calling a call center for Wells Fargo who may have me on call for uh, 20, 30 minutes before I talk to somebody. Uh, but as far as the makeup of the committee that you're, you're proposing, Mayor, uh, we our members fully support because they know they'll have a voice in that decision-making process. And that's all our members ever want, is to be able to say what they feel and what they believe is best for them. And then whatever happens, the you know, chips fall where they may. That's Thank all I've got. You. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to address council on this matter? So those in favor of the uh, ordinance as amended, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The clerk will call the roll. Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Aye. Alderwoman Turner. Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. Aye. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman DeCenso. Yes. Alderman McMenamin. Aye. Alderwoman Connolly. Alderman Donnelly. Aye. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. Nine ayes. The motion passes as amended, or the ordinance. Next item on the agenda is 2020-283, an ordinance authorizing execution of the subrecipient agreement number 18-SR-0006 with the end authorizing payment to Springfield Overly for providing monetary rental assistance to landlords, property owners on behalf of the qualified renters affected by COVID-19 with a maximum of $1,000 per rental utilizing Community Development Block Grant CARES Act funds in an amount not to exceed $442,156 through the Office of Planning and Economic Development for Emergency Passage. The Chair will entertain a motion. Place agenda number 2020-283 on emergency passage. So move. Second. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Alderman McMenamin. Would anyone like, I think this is a very uh, helpful ordinance for renters. Is that correct? Uh, we'll make uh, some $600,000 available to renters at $1,000 per um, petition or application. Does anyone want to comment on what we're doing with this uh, ordinance on emergency passage? I think this can really help our our tenants uh, throughout the city. Yeah, the uh, um, I'm not sure of the Urban League's administrative cost, but it uh, you know it's about four hundred thousand. I would say at least that for the thousand dollars per maximum level. So it just depends on the rental assistance. They're still uh, working out the uh, particulars with regards to the process. Uh, but there are funds available with community resources uh, with regards to rental assistance, and I believe that's through the state uh, assistance program. And then also they are running the Capital Township program where if someone did get an eviction notice, uh, they can call the community resources and uh, get uh, provided the rental assistance until this one's up and running. But we do anticipate this being up by the end of the month. Thank you. Yep. Just very briefly, you may recall the council had approved an amendment to the previous CDB chief plan uh, related to the $800,000 that the city received. So that is implementing the money there is uh, being used to implement this piece of that change that the council had voted on about a month and a half ago. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The <coughs> clerk will call the roll. Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Aye. Alderwoman Turner. Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. Aye. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman DeCenso. Yes. Alderman McMenamin. Aye. Alderwoman Connolly. Alderman Donnelly. Aye. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. Mayor Langfelder. Aye. We have 10 ayes and no nays, Mayor. And the ordinance passes. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is number 2020-284, an ordinance to increase the number of class AA liquor licenses by one for Buzzcraft LLC doing business as Cuckoo's Nest 2, located at 1724 Sangman Avenue East for emergency passage. Chair will entertain motion. Place agenda number 2020-284 on our emergency passage. So move. Second. Move and second. Any discussion? 
Yes, this is a this has been a long uh, process for these guys, and uh, Gary's had a great business out on the north end for as long as I can remember back, and I think this is going to be a good asset for uh, Alderman Fulgenzi and Ward Four. So, uh, good luck, Gary, and we hope everything goes well. Would you like to address the council? Yes. You want to speak? Yeah. Go ahead, Alderman Turner. Are, are you doing with your? <laughs> Alderman Turner. Um, no, that's okay. First of all, thank you guys for getting it passed through. It has been a long time. I understand that um, Mr. Oliver, for whatever reasons, things didn't go the way it was supposed to. Stuff happens. We understand that. And uh, just glad that took us into consideration to get it passed through. Like uh, Chuck said, I've been on the north, I was, had a bar on the north end for 11 years, had a good place, not much trouble, and I think we're gonna do well again. I uh, appreciate it. We well, appreciate uh, your business uh, being open and investing in Springfield, so thank you very much. You're welcome, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The clerk will call the roll. Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Aye. Alderman Turner. Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. Present. Noted. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderman DeCenso. Yes. Alderman McMiniman. Aye. Alderman Connolly. Alderman Donnellan. Aye. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. Aye. Mayor Langfelder. Aye. Nine ayes, one present, and the uh, ordinance passes. Thank you very much. Is there any unfinished business come before the city council? I'd like to welcome back uh, Council Coordinator Tim Griffin. Good to see you back here. Nice to be able to see everybody again. Is there any new business come before the council? Alderwoman DeCenso? Um, just very quickly, I would. I had a very serious situation last week, and I want to thank the Springfield Police uh, for helping to keep me safe. So huge thanks to Chief Winslow, Assistant Chief Scarlett, um, and Officers Jones, Pettit, and Termine. Um, you don't know how much it means to me and my son and my family, so I appreciate everything you did for me. Thank you. Any other new business? We do have a reminder Citizens Club, actually, uh, Director McCarty and myself are gonna go over the, most of the presentation tonight uh, for the Citizens Club on Friday. I think it's uh, Friday morning at eight o'clock, and then that will be a live stream. They're gonna have it here in the council room to give uh, more uh, space associated with that. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Alderman Repat. Would it be okay if we uh, had a moment of silence for Congressman John Lewis? Oh, that's good. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other new business? Do have a few people signed up. Uh, unfortunately, I just have their first name, uh, Sophia, regarding COVID-19 concerns. If you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. My name's Sophia Ashaber. I'm, my address is 1613 Westchester Boulevard, number six, Springfield, Illinois, 62704. I guess we can take this off. Mm. Uh, one second, it's on my phone. Okay, so hello, my name is Sophia, and I thank the council for allowing me to speak today. My concerns relate to the COVID-19 crisis we have going on uh, in Springfield, Illinois. I'm a lifelong citizen of the city and current college student in Boston, but since coming home, I have been employed actually as a contact tracer, uh, working for Partners in Health and the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts. 
Um, and I'm very familiar with the topic of COVID-19 and have spoken personally to many individuals who have been sick and have passed away to, uh, from the virus, um, which I think gives me a unique perspective of how d different types of people are affected by it since I talk to many people every day. Um, and one week ago, I went to the Sangamon County board meeting and uh, expressed my in concerns there. Um, you can watch the full minutes if you want to learn more, but I'm going to boil them down to four concerns. I said that I was concerned that the Department of Public Health um, said that restaurants are not required to tell customers about COVID positive COVID-19 cases coming into the restaurant, which you can see why that could be concerning. Um, I warned of the departure of the only free testing site for minors um, in Springfield, Illinois, and as schools are opening, and we also had a cluster with the YMCA recently, this is also a concern. I also had a concern about the lack of transparency between the board and the local board of health uh, regarding COVID, um, basically about public outreach and marketing. I don't think that the public is as aware as it could be about wearing a mask, social distancing, and just the general motto of that we're all in this together and this can't be an individualistic approach, um, kind of like how I feel like we're run as a country, very individualistic, but we can't be uh, in that sense for this situation. And then I was also concerned on how the county was planning on spending the $2.86 million grant they just received from the state. Um, and I asked about a certain plan that they were going to be using that money, but they were unable to give it to me at that time. Uh, on this last meeting, I was the only person from the public to request to speak, um, and at the end, I received no answers to my four concerns um, or even acknowledgments of my concerns, which leads me to believe that no plan or course of action moving forward is in place outside of what they're currently doing. Um, I understand the county holds a lot of power when it comes to navigating COVID-19 for Springfield as they, um, the local board of health is in their jurisdiction, but seeing that cases are spiking and we've had constant double digit days in the past week, I believe that the city um, of Springfield should be concerned as we make up the larger uh, percentage and population of the county. Um, I believe the city should be in constant conversation with that office to ensure that the most is being done to ensure um, that our citizens are being protected. And I personally believe we should not leave our city's fate in the hands of this county, but actively take steps to promote the words of scientists and experts in the field and constantly promoting wearing a mask, social distancing, everything you've seen on the news. And um, I also believe that the city should request a plan for how this grant money is going to be used as, again, Springfield, Illinois makes up the larger portion of the county. Um, and also making sure that we get a free testing site for minors as schools are opening and we're generally opening up more and that's very important to have. Realistically, this is going to get worse before it gets better. We've seen that happen in many states when we move into phase four. So I think we need to constantly be talking about this problem and um, it's very much related. We can't fix the economy going down if we don't fix the actual problem that is at hand. Uh, generally, I appreciate your time and look forward to any feedback you may have. Thank you. Do you have any, uh... I'm going to give you my email address. I want you to email me all of those concerns you have, and I will try to address them. It's too many, too many to try to address tonight, yeah. and I have more time to research. Thank you. Cool? Thank yes. you. Alderman uh, McMinimum. Uh, thank you, Sophia. That was an extraordinary list of understandings and concerns. You're uh, very well informed. Uh, I think you're a, you're a, you're a hands-on first responder in, in a kind of a way. Um, one question, issue you raised was um, disclosure issues, like when there's a positive, whether it be in a restaurant, mm -hmm. an institution, a, biz a business, What's the obligation for the public to become aware of first of, of uh, positives? And are there laws that prevent our county health department from disclosing where they know to be a positive? Um, currently, no. According to an article I read online from the News Channel 20, the <laughs> Department of Public Health, I don't know her last name, but her name's Gail. I think she's really nice. But um, she stated, or the department as a whole stated that um, restaurants or I believe any public facilities in general don't have to disclose of a positive case coming into their facility. Um, that's up to the thoughts or beliefs of that 
facility itself. So uh, I, in a situation, you could come into this space today and there could be a positive case in here, but you have no um, law saying that you have to tell the people in the room well, currently. Let's I don't shift know the of. question from the restaurant to the, the, the county health department. If the county health department knows where a positive is, is, is there any restriction on the county health department from disclosing to the public where they know to be a positive case? Mm, not that I'm aware of, since it wouldn't break HIPAA. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have. Thank you for speaking out. I appreciate it. Um, I'm wearing a mask on purpose to set an example. I don't think I really have to have a mask in these conditions, but I don't. I, you know, I'm not taking any chances. So um, that's why I'm. I've been wearing my mask during meetings. Um, but as far as the county goes, I have been actively reporting um, when I have heard, people have contacted me saying my son or my daughter works at this restaurant and this restaurant is not disclosing that they mm -hmm. have positive cases here. Um, there was a restaurant in the county, not in the city, that was a server tested positive and he had served several other business owners in Springfield mm -hmm. on a certain weekend. And this was before the spike. so. Um, you know, that's concerning. So maybe when you go to get a donut, someone serving you has been served by someone who just had COVID. Um, there is a lack of transparency. Uh, this is not a new issue. We agree with you. We are the um, county seat, if you will. And, you know, this is, this is not a new issue that we are, are dealing with. I've been, I've been trying to get on the Board of Health with the county since October 8th. Um, and they won't let me on. So, you know, this, this isn't a new issue. We, we don't feel we have equal representation as a city with the county board. So I share your concerns. Thank you. And uh, you said your contact tracer is that here or where's it at? Uh, I do it remotely from uh, my room, but I am, well, I work for Mount Massachusetts. Okay. And then um, what is, do the, what's their role with regards to, um, making restaurants um, make notification or, you know, uh, or the health department making notification to the public about positive t uh, tests? Um, I am not absolutely 100% sure, but I would assume they would know. And there's a process through my job that we could identify clusters, so and I'm then not 100% sure. Tracing, uh, are you familiar with how we do tracing? Is it different or is it the same? Or um, I went to the meeting last week and they had said they had about 13 contact tracers. I'm not exactly sure. I think there's three full time, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, there are like specific processes and the amount of days they've decided for quarantine and isolation. So mm -hmm. I, that hasn't been publicly announced, at mm -hmm. least to me. Mm -hmm. Alderman Henner? Yeah. It, uh I'm not sure. Is is there an issue with with the whole HIPAA rules and stuff? Because uh, I, I'm just asking. I don't. It seems like HIPAA seems to get in a lot of ways, in the way a lot of times, and and you know. I think I can answer that. HIPAA is, if I say Ralph Hanauer, has. Okay. HIPAA is not. Somebody was in this room who was infected. Mm -hmm. I know it's you, but I didn't say it to you. To me, that's it. Yeah. Okay. It's not HIPAA if I say this word. It's right. Like, Correct. I say it with you. That's All the women, Turner. No, I, I really I appreciate your your comments as well. They were very detailed, and I think that um, as all the women distancial said. We all share your concerns. I think that it is very concerning, especially now that we are in um, phase four. That we that. There seems to be, no one seems to feel that there's an obligation to let people know if there is a business and someone who either works there or has been there has tested positive. Because that, to me, that's a, a public health issue. Absolutely. Because you're, you're actually endangering the life of the public, anybody who would, who would go in there. So um, I think that... I think that it, that's a concern that most people share, that we do need to have a better way of informing the public if there is an issue. I think the other problem, the other problem too is that not all businesses necessarily 
conform to the process that should be followed once an employee or someone who is in your business has tested positive. There is a uniform code of what should happen, but I've gotten a lot of reports from employees that that's not necessarily what, what does happen. So I think that there also needs to be some kind of re uh, in, uh, test area or, or, you know, where you go back to kind of recertify that that deep, deep clean has, has actually happened. This is serious, and it's not going to get any less serious, even though it's not a hoax. <laughs> it's not going to get any less serious, and people are literally dying because we're not taking it as seriously as we should. Yeah, Treasurer Busher just informed me she received a text today or just recently about um, Schnucks had an employee. Was it an employee? Yep. Uh, yes, they sent an email to all their customers saying that there was an employee and everything they have cleaned and what they have done. So I think the point is that's what you want businesses to do is right. to handle it yes. professionally and tell the public and let the public know they're making changes. So, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, that's the important thing. We want uh, the businesses to report it to, as they can and inform their customers and be uh, proactive in that regards. And I don't know if Chief Riney or uh, Alderman Turner can answer this, uh, as a member of the Public Health Board. Um, have they, uh, on the testing site, because I've gotten a lot of calls on that, have they uh, discussed uh, possibly re-upping that or what the cost would be? Because I think they, uh, didn't they receive $2 million recently? And, that, uh, I don't know the answer to that. That okay. site, I'm sorry. No, you sure you're done? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> My answer was, I don't know. <laughs> um, that site was never meant to be permanent. The, the governor's office was setting up um, sites on a rotating basis throughout the state. It was actually only supposed to be here one week, and they kept extending it and extending it, and they had made a commitment to Hillsboro that it would go and they kept extending out the date, and so that became a, a date final. I have been in conversation with individuals, and they are uh, trying to bring it back uh, faster than what was anticipated, but they're also looking at trying to um, increase the capacity of Sangamon County uh, to you know, be able to handle, handle more tests. I think the, the main concern is the fact that that was the only site that did um, children. So I think that that's where they're trying to right. look at increasing the, the capacity. I think it was also the only site where you could, you didn't have to have an appointment, you didn't have to be, uh, didn't have to have any symptoms. Mayor? Yeah. Did, yeah. Yeah. Do we know what the test site cost? I mean, per week, do we even know what that is? Because, or what the two million that the know. public health is, utilizing their funds for or, yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Because one of the unique things about that site, which was uh, different than the Walgreens site, is that they actually had staff that performed the test. Mm -hmm. The Walgreens site, they kind of do a quick tutorial and then you perform the test. And so it was actually the preferred site because, you know, because of that, so. Mayor. Alderman Hanauer. Well, and one, one of the issues I happen to, I, I, I was contacted by someone that, that tried to, to get a test. Um, and when they call, they, they called Walgreens and they were told there's no appointments until Sunday. Mm -hmm. This was on Monday. They said there's no appointments till Sunday. They call the, the, net, the memorial or whoever it was and they were, they were on hold for 30 minutes and finally they just gave up. They went to Walgreens to try to get a test. Were, t were turned away. And uh, what I'm hearing is a lot of the, now that we're doing a lot of um, the, the, the procedures in the hospitals, they're, they're making everybody get a test and they're filling up the, the, the testing centers with patients that are gonna go in, which is just fine because our hospitals need to make money too. But for the general public that's not going through that, we got to be able to get get them a test more, you know, sooner than a week, um, because some of these people, you know, they they need to work, 
you know, servers or whatever. They need to work. They need to know that they're, they're negative or they don't go to work. And, and I, I just think that, you know, shutting down one, if there was nobody going to them, I, I could see, but you can see an up, you know, you can see more people going. And I don't know, you know, Alan, I don't know if, 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 if you've heard more of that from the, from the committee, but I, I do know I've had, I had one person that, that contacted me regarding that. And uh, they were very, uh, to say, they were just downright mad about it because they didn't think they were positive, but they wanted to make sure before they went to work. Mm -hmm. And people should be able to do that. And the, the only thing I would add to that is there's almost zero local control over anyone. Yeah. Walgreens is a private site. I think right. they're getting reimbursed. Right. But it's a private site, um, and IDPH pretty much owns the rest of it. It's my understanding that the uh, state actually hired the testing group, and so that's why I was curious of uh, what the amount is, uh, because they were testing, I think, um, someone from the medical profession said 400 tests a day. So if you can imagine that not being available now, it goes to Altman Hanauer's point, goes to Director McCarty's point at the beginning, because if I can't work, you know, uh, thank God uh, the public works employees stayed home. They felt ill, they stayed home. If they would have went in, just think what would have happened. They could have infected the whole garage, and uh, it's a domino impact. But if you have to work, luckily they work at the city, and uh, we covered that, but some... Uh, some places aren't able to do that. And uh, the workers, you know, that's what their first concern is, putting food on the table. And so it really puts uh, everybody in a precarious situation. So that's why I was curious about the amount because, uh, you know, that's a perfect example. The 4.8 million we have waiting at the state, you know, if it was uh, 500,000 a, a week or whatever the cost is, we'd have to determine what's the amount for us. Is that what we want to spend the money on? Because otherwise it's just sitting there. So we should just hire that group and open up the test site. So we'll have to, uh, we're still trying to find out what the cost is and if that company would uh, be available if they have other crews for that testing. So hopefully we'll get the answer to that and move in that direction, but time will tell. But well, we appreciate you coming and enlightening all of us. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, what grade are you in again? I'm a rising senior at oh, very good. college, yeah. Excellent. Well, hopefully you come back to Springfield when it's all said and done. Hopefully. <laughs> where, where are you at? Where, what school are you at in here? Uh, Wellesley College, right oh, okay. outside Boston. And where'd you go to high school? Springfield. Springfield High School. Mm -hmm. Senators. You, uh, when you email me, I'll answer your email. I'll, I'll copy you guys all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jim. Is uh, Anthony or Linda here? They wanted to speak about rental assistance. Is there any other business or anybody else wish to address the council? Motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. We move and second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. We're adjourned. Thank you.